Thanks everyone for coming. We're going to actually broadcast this live on Facebook. And this uh, presentation is saved on our Dropbox if you want to go back through it. If anyone has any questions, they can ask while we're going. We're, uh, first of all, thanks everyone for coming. The reason we do this is we really appreciate you as customers and we're willing to work to keep you. That's why we we'll, we field about 20 technical calls a day. So don't, you don't have to apologize if you call with questions. I wouldn't say we've heard them all, but we've heard a whole lot of them. So we can generally walk you through what went wrong. I'm Mark, that's Vinny and Emilio behind the thing there, and Bob's over there. And we're fortunate we have two representatives from Polytech, so we'll be casting rubber and they can answer any questions you have about mold making rubber today. We've also got our uh, West Coast distributor here, two guys from there, Silica Systems, and they also make tiles. I'm sure they'll be glad to share secrets. And we've got a couple other guys coming who are very good at their craft. One of the benefits about having this class is people get to talk among themselves and share ideas. Because we don't do this all the time. I'm fortunate that I get to go visit people and have class and we get to learn from you just as much as you're learning from us. The whole idea is we're promoting concrete. That's why on our Facebook page, if you have projects you did, we'll promote you. We get followed by about 20,000 designers now out of 160,000 people because we're promoting concrete. We believe in the rising tide. Everyone does good when one of us does good. If you have any questions while we're going, feel free to ask. We'll cover uh, pre-mix GFRC. I'll explain the difference, a brief history, mix ingredients. They're very simple when, it, when you break it down. How to add color, equipment, problems, which is the most important, and what we believe is the future. GFRC, somebody had an idea that if you use glass fiber, that the fiberglass guys were doing this well before us. Anybody who owned a fiberglass boat, they spray a gel coat, which is basically a face coat, and they back it with fiber. Well, somebody had the idea that we could do something similar to concrete, but they used regular glass, and the glass deteriorated in the concrete. So the big advancement was AR, or alkali-resistant glass, and a change in mix designs allowed it to go forward. It's a simple 50-50. It started out with a whole lot more cement, and then gradually if people use a 50-50. We'll explain to you today, we're going to use a little bit different ratios depending on what we're doing to make it stick better, less bug holes, flow better. And then the glass fiber is our reinforcement. You don't need uh, metal, rebar. You don't need wire mesh. You don't need any of that if you design your glass fiber piece properly. You might need scrim, but other than that, you should be able to do it without metal. And it's strictly for non-structural elements. The way to look at it is the GFRC does not hold the building up. In a parking garage, a precast parking garage, the structural elements are also the design elements, and they hold up the building. In our case, GFRC is non-structural. In fact, it has problems with long spans you have to do some things to account for that. So I wouldn't make a lentil out of it, you don't make you know, headers out of it, or wall panels that hold the floor up. Strictly non-structural. What we do, what 99% of our customers do, is pre-mix GFRC. In pre-mix, we mix the fiber into the matrix before we cast it, or spray it. Now spray up, what the big guys do, and I would say the big guys, if we were making 10 by 20 wall panels, we would probably use spray up. In spray up, this chopper gun chops the strand of fiber into lengths and it mixes it with the mortar as you spray. In premix, we can use a three to three and a half percent fiber load, and it's only three quarter inch. You could use one, but you really don't gain much advantage. In premix, they can use up to a five percent fiber load and they use much longer fibers. They can use inch and a half or two inch fiber. The fiber is different. You can't uh, use chopped fiber in our stuff because our stuff, while it's mixing, it doesn't uh, break into small particles, as we'll see. There's a lot of advantage to the yeast. This is easier quality control because you know how much fiber is going in. This is harder quality control. This stuff can be what we call direct cast, where you just pour it without a face coat, which we're gonna do a lot of today where that spray up is, uh, you can't do that. You gotta have a face coat.
People have uh, come up with different names, what I call ECC, engineered cementitious composite. It's almost a GFRC mix with PVA fiber a lot of times in it. RPC, reactive powder concrete, will show you how to make a basic one that will hit over 20,000 PSI. It's just stacking different size particles. If you use different size sands, it's not a sprayable mix, but you can use the same cement content and go from, say, 14,000 to 20,000 if you think you need that. And it'll flow and fill in a little bit better. The rest of the world's way ahead of us. They just call it GRC or glass reinforced concrete. It's huge in uh, China, the Middle East, Turkey. They're way, way ahead of us. Even Australia's way ahead of us. They have more GFRC guys than they do precasters. Can you give an example of where RPC would be used? Uh, if you had to make uh, Mike Taylor, the guy who does tile, I would call his mix an RPC mix because you hit. He hits probably 18,000 PSI for tile, and he direct casts them, and he wants them absolutely flawless, no bug holes at all. Textural follows the PSI? No. We'll see later that I just had this discussion with a guy who's thinking about starting a plant to make wall panels, and he said, do I need ultra high performance concrete? I said, well, you need concrete that's strong enough not to warp, which is probably 10 to 12,000, but once you get above 14,000, the flexural doesn't keep going up. We in, that's why we invested $20,000 for a flexural test machine, so I could test all these different scenarios. And you can't get higher flexural by getting higher compressive. It stops. It levels off. It's probably 80 to 90 percent flexural is fiber load and fiber. The other 10 to 20 percent comes from mix. And the Compressive, as we'll see, you need high enough not to warp your piece. That's our goal, and to be able to deliver the piece. And once you're above 10, 12,000, which all our mixes are, compared to liquid polymers, they peak out at like six or 7,000. You stop gaining flexural. Why is the difference between the powder and the liquid? Well, our powder, we use, a, rather than a large molecule, we use smaller molecules, for starters, and so our powder has a larger surface area. It's like, uh, I guess it's fine, as fine as tobacco smoke. And so it does things internally that you need more of the liquid to do, and it doesn't hinge upon the strength gain. And then plus ours is blended. We blend a uh, polymer, a shrinkage reducer, defoamer, a wetting agent, all in the right ratios. I forget who told me. He said, years ago, you used to tell people to do this. I said, yeah, but it was too complicated. Now we have just add this and then get this result, rather than adding all the other things. You can use a liquid and you can add a shrinkage reducer and you can add defoamer and you can add a wetting agent to it, which is four things, or you can use our powder and have higher strength and have a simpler time of doing it. What There's. Is, what is the uh, limit in size of a tile that will be? Uh, well, you could make a three quarter inch tile, five foot by 10 foot. If you go, what is the narrow, thinnest tile you can get? In I, I would make a three ace tile, one by one, maybe two by two. I would go half inch if I made a three foot by three foot tile. And then there's, you know, you need high compressive strength on tile because you need low absorption. There's a job, uh, I don't want to get too far ahead. There's a job in New York City, they laid a whole lobby in tile. And uh, the next day they came back and every tile was cupped. Well, their concrete was strong enough to make it to the job site and get laid in a wet bed, but it was, it was weak enough in compression where it absorbed moisture and swelled. So there's a lot you have to watch out for in tile. It's not just make it to the job and lay it. It's make it strong enough and compressive so that the density is low enough so it doesn't absorb moisture, even though your compressive strength uh, doesn't really help your flexural. What is your experience with floor tiles, with large floor tiles? We have customers that make sometimes four foot by six foot. I think we have a guy in Lebanon, he was making eight foot by four foot floor tile, three quarters of an inch. So the answer is as big as you want, as big as you yeah, can get it installed. Because I know that Dactyl don't recommend anymore to use their product for floor tiles. So I just want because they have the problems I just talked about, where our stuff you can't. Today we're going to be mixing with cement 
and silica fume, that's what all that is. Sand, water, admixtures, AR glass. It's pretty simple. You don't actually need the pozzolan, but if you want to get from 9,000 to 13 or 14,000, you use the pozzolan. It makes denser, stronger concrete, etc. And it also, as we'll see, gives you higher flexural strength because it protects the AR glass from deterioration. Does the silica fume give a higher strength than something like V-cast? Uh, it's 100 times finer than cement. V-cast is about the same size as cement, so it takes a long, long time for it to hit strength. Maybe eventually in 56 or 128 days they would catch up. But I like silica fume because it's 100 times finer than cement, so it gives you particle packing and its reactions much faster than other puzzles. So there's not the lag you get. Does that have any impact on like coloring with like uh, carbon black or something like that where you have capillary issues? Well, it'll not eliminate, but <clears throat> I worked with a customer in San Francisco. His biggest problem was he was making black wall panels for outdoors, and they're almost impossible to uh, prevent efflorescence and prevent whiting out. And so, yes, it does help lock the color in because there's less, the higher the compressive, the lower the density. The lower the density, the less the uh, capillary action. And the less likely it is to effloresce with silica fume because you're using up all the calcium hydroxide. Now, everyone, <clears throat> one of the problems we have is people ask me, is St. Mary's cement okay? I have no clue because there's probably a hundred different gray cement mills in the U.S. That's not to say you can't use gray cement, but some will give you terrible problems because of the high alkali content, and they all work different chemically with admixtures. So if you use the gray and you tried to spray, oh, it won't spray, it's, it's liquid running out with your admix. I have no clue. So the majority of people <coughs> use type 1 white because there's a limited amount of mills, number one, and it's lower alkali, number two. So if you're using a <coughs> federal white, there's only one mill. Unfortunately, they shut off the western U.S., but there's one mill. And out west, you can get Lehigh that comes from Mexico that's good. So people kind of find a cement that works and they can get with regularity and keep using it. We do have customers that use only gray cement to make production items, but they have a good gray that they know is low alkali. So the lesson is buy a white or if you're in production and you want to save money, sure, you can use a gray, but test the gray first. Don't go to the Home Depot and buy cement. The reason is they buy cement on the open market. This week's Home Depot cement is different than next week's. Maybe last week's worked good, this one didn't. So you have to be very careful about the cement you use. It varies, you know. The white cements, there's some different ones that are imported. For instance, there's chimsa. Chimsa is very finely ground, and so it reacts much different than federal, which is uh, less ground. But if you find a cement that works, the lesson is use it. If you're having problems with your, your cement, call us up. We'll help you, help you uh, solve it. Either that or we'll ship you a bag of federal cement, and then you compare the federal, which is kind of the gold standard, to what you're using, and then you can tell the difference. Gray federal made out of. <clears throat> well, you got to remember now, gray, there's brands of cement. Lehigh is a brand of gray. It could come from any of, I don't know, 20 different Lehigh mills. Oh, it's a Lehigh cement. Federal? No, federal has a plant, one plant in uh, eastern Canada. Oh, it's in Canada. Yeah, and they're actually a privately owned company, which I didn't know. Okay. And they used to sell to Lafarge, which rebranded as Trinity. And, you just have to track down the end mill. But you say compare it. If you're talking gray cement, compare it to it. <coughs> what way? Well, you'd mix a batch with federal white, and you can predict what's going to happen because we do it, and we have, you know, a thousand customers that do it. And then you try your gray, and then you see what, what happens differently. And then you'll know, well, it sprays, it doesn't spray. Well, if this happens, yeah, that happens. You know? saying, just workability. Exactly. It'll change drastically. One of the reasons that we use silica fume, it's a pozzolan. Pozzolans on their own, there's exceptions, but most, if you mix with water, aren't cementitious on their own. There's one of the byproducts of cement hydration is free lime. 
the free lime will, that's the stuff if you get cement burns, will take the hair off you and then the next step is it eats your flesh away. It's not an acid burn, it's an alkali burn. It'll etch glass. Well, the main component in silicon fume is silicon dioxide, which is one of the main components in glass. The pozzolans attack the silicon dioxide, melt it, and change it into particles that help with the hardness of your concrete. That's how they work. There's different ones, you know, there's VCAS. Well, it might be similar chemistry, but the particles are so much bigger that it takes a long time for it to consume, or it takes a much shorter time for it to consume a smaller particle. But they help prevent efflorescence, which is the free lime leaching out of the concrete. And that's where you get the white streaks. If you ever looked at a brick building they put up in the wintertime, you'll see streaks of white running down it. Because the mortar didn't set enough by the time it rained and it sucked the free alkalis out. Well, we don't want that. We're making high-end uh, stuff with our stuff. We don't want any of that. That's where silica fume helps. Are you saying that in 100 mixes, you would have 99 that would be alkali-free in terms of efflorescence? You wouldn't have any issues with it? Efflorescence. Uh, needs water and then it needs leachability to happen. That's why when I was an architectural precaster, we would sweat it when the temperature was 40 degrees and dropping and raining outside because we knew that if we put a piece outside, the rain would draw the alkalis out and we would have efflorescence. Yet if it was uh, weather like this, we cured it in our shop to 5,000, 6,000, you could put it in the yard and it wouldn't efflorescence. So it's a function of weather and alkalis. You need alkalis to be present and then the weather to draw them out. But if we cure stuff the way we're going to show you to cure it, there won't be any problem with uh, alkalis. Unless you use a high alkali gray, then you run into other problems. <clears throat> now OSHA has come up with new rules on silicon exposure. The important thing is to re know what type of silica you're being exposed to. There's two types. There's crystalline, which is not reactive in Portland cement, but that causes silicosis. I always remember crystalline causes cancer. Crystalline would be the sand we're going to use today. You wouldn't want to use a dusty silica sand. If you do, wear a respirator, because it's not one time, it's the thousandth time you breathe it in that's going to get you. Now, amorphous silica is silica that's been through a fire mostly. Silica fume, it's a byproduct of a production of silica. It comes out the chimney and then the scrubbers catch it. Fly ash comes out the chimney. The uh, VCAS is ground from fiberglass waste product. So it's a glass. It's been through that process. Once it's been through that process, the good news is it doesn't cause cancer because it's amorphous. Now amorphous silicas can cause or prevent ASR. Everyone knows you shouldn't put glass in concrete because of alkali silica reactivity. Well, if you grind glass fine enough, it becomes a positive because it's small enough. So it either causes or prevents ASR, which is kind of odd, isn't it? Where the amorphous silica, like the Q-Rock we're going to use today, doesn't cause ASR, but it causes silicosis. So it's important to know what you're dealing with. Like our silica fume is amorphous. It's a nuisance dust. I don't know if it won't kill you, but it's not going to have the effect that a silica, a crystalline silica would. So even though it's a dust. Now cement has both types in it, so you want to be careful around cement. It has both some crystalline and some amorphous in it. One of the ingredients in cement is uh, silicon dioxide. It's been through a fire, a cement kiln, so we know it's amorphous silica, right? Just. Uh, if you put glass in, no, it can cause ASR. You prevent it by adding a silica, a smaller particle, like our silica fume. That'll prevent it. Now, sands, there's, a, there's more than two types, but <clears throat> sand types, the sedimentary sand, it's when a river ran and it left below sand that's been tumbled, rocks got in, made into smaller rocks, and et cetera, et cetera. The problem with it is it's softer than a silica, so it has a higher absorption. So if you take a sedimentary sand that's oven dry, put it in your mix, it's going to suck a lot of water out of your mix. 
If your mix is below 60, say in the 50s, you mix it and five minutes later it got really tight. Well, that's probably your sand sucking the water in, which as we'll see can cause problems for days in advance. Where a high quality silica sand, like we're going to use today, might have an absorption of 0.25%. A sedimentary sand can be 3%, meaning it's going to suck 3% of its weight in water and it's going to satisfy its absorption with mixed water and that could lead to other problems. So there again, you need to find a sand, you test it, trust your cement, federal white, you mix a batch, your batch is below 60 so you know it's not heat that's false setting it, wait five minutes. If it false sets to the point where you can't mix it anymore, that's your sand sucking water. in. You can deal with it, yes, you can pre-wet your sand or you can allow for the absorption, but just be aware that false setting, for the most part, comes from sand. It can come from certain cements, federal it doesn't come from, Lehigh from Mexico, no, but for the most part it's sand. If you buy Home Depot sand, I have no idea, because there again, they buy from whoever is local and can supply their sand. So fine Home Depot sand doesn't mean anything to me, you just have to try it or play sand. It may or may not work. Are you saying you shouldn't rely on the spec data sheets from the quarries that produce the sand? You can, but a lot of times they won't tell you the absorption. Okay. If they tell you absorption, it's great. If you okay. see a 2% absorption, you know you're in trouble. Right. If you see a extremely low, well, this is probably going to work. And most, it doesn't apply to most ready-mix places because their sand is in a wet condition. Where if we use sand in a wet condition, it would ruin the preciseness of what we do. There are some people that do that and they understand that it changes a little, but uh, trying to balance the sand moisture with the preciseness of our mixes can be tough. So you always need to have bag sand? So Most people do. They use a dry, an oven dry sand. So that it's, today it's going to be just like baking a cake. The weather will be different, but other than heat, you know, you should be able to replicate what you did today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day with uh, changes in heat, temperature, and all that. But you should be able to replicate it. Here's why we use the sand sizes we use. As the U.S., I don't know, uh, there's probably a thousand different ways to classify sand sizes. The only one I look at is U.S. mesh size. The U.S. mesh size tells us what the water demand will be. The higher the mesh size, the higher the water demand. What we have to do is we have to, when we spray a face coat, we have to reach a compromise in sand size. We can't spray a face coat up here because we have to add plasticizer. When you add plasticizer, too much plasticizer, it gets sticky and it doesn't want to flow and it doesn't want to spray and when you spray it, it runs down. So you need water to spray a face coat. That said, if we sprayed a face coat down at the 1020 range, it would bounce all over the place and it would be more likely to bleed out when you mix it. These will hold water in suspension better. These will bleed out easier. Somewhere in here, 4050 mesh is where you want the size of sand to spray a face coat. Today we have a 4050 mesh and we're going to adjust our mix a little. And we'll spray a face coat. It'll run through the gun. It'll stick. The water demand won't be excessive. You won't get map cracking, crazing, all that. So you could you could SCC, ultra high performance mixes are made up of these sizes up in here if you wanted to do super high absorb, super high performance. Cohesiveness I would define as a mix's ability to hold itself together, meaning you don't have bleed water and it flows. So the lower or the bigger the sand size, the less cohesive a mix is. So when you make a self consolidating mix out of a 1020, it's harder to not have bleed water than if you make it here. This is a great compromise. We're going to pour everything out of this today because we don't need the 20,000 PSI. You know, we're happy with 11, 10. You can hit 16 with this size sand. But if you want to get in the 20,000, you need to go up higher. And then we want to maintain cohesive. If there's people that direct cast using this, but they know their mixes. So if you can find out what U.S. mesh size your sand is, that's a very good starting point to whether or not it'll work. And sometimes it's a little hard to find that out.
Here's the sand we're going to use today, number one Q-Rock from uh, U.S. Silica. You can see it's 40-50 mesh, a blend. It doesn't have a whole lot of little stuff, which is causes dust, which is no good. It doesn't have a whole lot of big stuff. But every sand, you're right, the quarry has this data on file. Sometimes they'll have the absorption, sometimes they won't. Today we're going to use ice in our face coats because we have to. You cannot mix concrete. I wouldn't mix it, I wouldn't want it above 70 degrees if I was spraying a face coat. Because then you get in the fall set, flash set, doesn't run through the gun right, doesn't last. Ideal mix will be below 60 for a face coat. Because then you've got plenty of time. That mass, you mix a mass of a bucket, if it crosses that threshold of 80 degrees, it just takes off, it wants to get hard all at once. So if we can keep that mass cool, the outside temperature becomes almost irrelevant. People in Texas and LA, they use three quarters of their batch as ice by weight because they want their batches in the 50s because it's 110 degrees in their shop. There'll probably be 85 in here, so we'll use oh, maybe a quarter ice just so it runs good for face coats. But like we talked about, you need water to spray a face coat. You can't spray a face coat at a point 2-4 water cement ratio because it won't run through the gun without plasticizer and then that catch-22 you put plasticizer in then it won't hold the vertical. So you need the right size and then you need cool. Coolness really affects the rheology which is how a mix flows. It'll, yesterday when I helped Bill we were up to 0.75% uh, plasticizer because it was hot. Our mixes were 85 but we were direct casting so we didn't care. If we tried to spray a face coat at that, we'd be in trouble because it would start to set in the gun. And, you know, by the time you got a back coat on, it'd be too late. Where here today, we're going to use ice, probably half ice, I would say, in our face coats would be fine. But you want the face coat to cure rather than dry. If we sprayed a face coat outside in that sun, let the sun hit it for 10 minutes, we're guaranteed to have map cracking tomorrow because it dried rather than cured. If you spray your, spray your face coat too thin, it will dry rather than cure. So we want it to cure. We're trying to cure something very thin, a quarter inch thick, rather than dry. You can mist it with water and do other things, but you definitely don't want it to dry, or else you'll, it'll crack for sure. Now, people ask, why do you add the admix? One of the reasons is it holds the water in place to allow the water to hydrate the cement. It, back in the day, they used to take GFRC and put it in a wet chamber for seven days to cure it. Well, the polymer, uh, you can feel it, it <coughs> skin over, it locks the moisture within the piece, and so it can stay in place, hydrate the cement, not leave, not crack the piece. That's one of the functions. For increased ductility means strength and bending. It actually cushions the cement particles, so when you go to bend the piece, it'll have more flexibility. And we'll show you, you can actually see it on tests. The other thing is water reduction. You don't want to reduce too much water or with a face coat, but you want to reduce some so you can spray a face coat at a, maybe a 0 .30, 0 .34, somewhere in there, depending on temperature. One of the things with a face coat, you're spraying through the air, it's losing moisture. It's thin on the piece, and as it's curing, it's also losing moisture. So in the summertime, you might spray at a slightly higher water cement ratio than the winter when it's losing less moisture. I like to heat everything because I'm an old precaster. We had to cycle our forms every day. Sometimes we cycle our forms every five hours. Heat does that. Concrete curing is logarithmic. It's like the Richter scale. Each uh, Every time you go up, it's a hockey stick shaped curve. So it hangs out at 50, 60, 70, and all of a sudden hits 80 or 90. Get to 110, you can gain 1,000 PSI per hour. So the key is cool your mix in the summer, put uh, plastic on, sometimes blankets. If it's going above 100, 140, it's no good because they're so thin it can actually bake off the moisture. But if you want to strip every day large section pieces without warpage, you want to get them to eight or 9,000. Then they're hard enough where they won't want to absorb moisture, 
if you're wetting them, and they won't want to give off moisture, which is the cause of warpage. And heat is one of the things that does it. Today we won't use accelerator on pieces except the ones we bend. Ordinarily, you can use CSA or calcium sofa aluminum cement, but it's so hot out, if our mix is 85, we can just use accelerator and it'll set. We did one yesterday. It was direct cast, just to test. It was hard in, I would say, 20 minutes we were bending them. You can see pieces we bent yesterday. So it depends on temperature. But you can't control a mix in the 80s. There's nothing you can do. In the 90s, it doesn't matter how much uh, retarder you put in, you still have trouble controlling it. So you got to start low and then build up. In the wintertime, it's different. You may have to use hot water if your mixes are below 60. But in the summertime, ice and then heat. You mentioned at the beginning that 95% of GFRC is premix. I would say so. So 5% would require face mix spray. Can you give me just a general idea of what type of products would require the face mix as opposed to the premix? Anytime that you are going to manipulate the piece, meaning acid etch, grind, or sandblast. Uh, sandblast you need a face coat. Okay. If you don't do that, your fiber will show. If you don't have a face coat and acid at you, your fiber will show. We'll do both today. Some pieces will do a face coat because it's more convenient. And anytime you have a three-dimensional piece and you don't want to back mold, you're going to need a face coat because it's hard to, uh, unless you have a back mold, you can't direct cast it. So in three-dimensional pieces, it does save you. Working with one customer that has a building system, his idea is he wants returns. So, and he wants the sandblast. I'm like, well, you cannot do that without a face coat. He's like, no, I want to direct cast them. I said, well, you have a choice. Either you use a face coat and you sandblast or whatever, or you don't and use form liners to get your texture. So okay, then, so in order to get the actual aggregate exposed, you'd have to do a spray up. Right, where or else you see it. Where you use just the texture, what color, application, whatever, simulation, then you can use a premix. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And you can, uh, a lot of what we'll do today is we'll combine methods. We'll spray up and then we'll SCC a back coat, self-consolidated back coat. One of the uh, notions that got perpetuated and was totally wrong was people said you needed to apply your premix in layers and roll between layers. Well, with our admix, you don't need to do that. And what we did is, like I said, we invested in machinery to test. We don't just tell you it's right. We test and prove it's right. So we got rid of all that. You don't need to do things in layers. The exception is, if you'll see, we're hand placing a back coat. You want to do a skim coat so you get adhesion and then add more. But if you're doing a flat, if you dump it in, just let it self-level, it's the same strength as if you were to do it in layers and roll it. There's no strength difference. So it's a complete waste of your time. Right. And with our stuff, the, the compaction comes from our chemicals. And so you don't need to compact and remove air the way you would with a liquid polymer. The quality control, the compressive is important. Compressive tells us the density of our piece. The density of our piece tells us how stable it's going to be. Number one, long term, because outside with acid rain and stuff, you want something that's durable. Number two is absorption. Absorption directly related to compressive strength. The higher the compressive strength, the lower the absorption. The lower the absorption, the less likely it is to warp, period. So if we can get our compressive strength up above eight or 9,000, our pieces don't want to warp in conjunction with using chemicals. Will they not absorb moisture in an outside act? outside uh, environment we, at that point? Then. We've had people test absorption as low as 1%. When standard GFRC, I don't know why, calls for less than 10% absorption, which is ridiculous. Right. You know? What are your absorptions out west, Mike? Less than 1%. Which is incredible. That's granted almost, you know? Less than 1%. But then there's, if you lay that tile in a wet bed, the absorption is important because it won't suck the water out of the mastic. Or if you uh, laid it outside on a building, it rains, it won't suck the uh, water in, right? What about ground contact? Would you lay it with ground contact and still? Exactly, grow? because it doesn't want to absorb moisture. If it does, it'll work, plain and simple.
but that's a, it's a highly specialized test for GFRC flexural strength. We actually invested in the machine to do it so that we can test our stuff and test other people's stuff if ever want, wants to see it tested. And it's, uh, I wouldn't call it hard to do, but it's very precise the way you have to test it. I was a PCI guy for 20 years, so I'm used to running labs and whatnot. But even I had, had to learn how to make the samples exactly the way they're supposed to be made, cut them at the right time, soak them at the right time. I don't like the test, but we follow it. And, report the results. That's where we tested 3%, uh, 4%, 5% fiber and found that there's no advantage to continually adding fiber to premix. It peaked at like 3.5%. Above that, you're wasting money. Have you published anything on comparison with other GFRC mix? Well, we do that for customers, but we don't publish it. Okay. Because that's not, you know what I mean. We're, we're happy with our stuff. We don't need to Regular. Right. We let our, our tests speak for themselves. Very good. And people can look and say, you know, here's what they got. You're right. We're happy with what we do. Here's what we're talking about, about ductility. This is GFRC that we wet cured with no admixture and wet cured it for seven days. What this means is it broke and then that was it. It didn't take any more load. It just snapped. Kind of like a piece of granite would snap with no reinforcement, even though it had reinforcement. The flexural yield and ultimate strength are very close, meaning it lacks ductility. Here's one. Each one of these represents an individual test. You always do at least six to see a curve. But with our admixture, it takes the initial and then it takes the higher load before it ultimately fails. It bends without breaking rather than just snapping clean. And that's the difference. The difference between what? Difference between no admix and wet curing okay. and using admix and not wet curing, just stripping the next day in air curing. That was the breakthrough that came with the addition of polymers to GFRC, that you could actually pour something, strip it the next day. Was there any difference between the dry and the wet? Uh, polymers? There again, we know what the difference is, and we'd be glad if someone wants to switch, we help them do the testing and realize it, because we know what our stuff does, and we know what theirs does. Typically, our curves are about 10% higher than theirs. Our compression's off the chart compared with theirs. But there again, we <coughs> the compression is important, but the flexural is the main thing we're after. Can we use some trioxide meshes? Well, I'll tell you what, we tested, uh, I don't know, probably 30 different combinations of the uh, scrim inside of coupons, but what happens is the scrim is similar to rebar in a wet cast piece. It doesn't take the load until you start to get a bend. The scrim changed the ultimate, but it didn't change the initial because it had to come into tension before it did anything. Ultimate being the breaking point? Yeah. That's so where that's it would good. fail and fall off a building or whatever. <laughs> so if you want to build something that's a bit more structural or more... Scrim would help. Yeah. Yeah, it would help it bend more without... Okay. Because the ultimate was higher. Fiber gets to be confusing to some people, but we've necked it down to here's what you need to know. It's available in single filament. A PDA RSV15 is a single filament fiber. It means when you mix it, it breaks into a single piece in your mix. Now, there's 100 bundle and 200 bundle. The problem with the single filament is you could never add enough of that to equal the strength of a bundled glass fiber. So, I'm gonna, if you want to pour something with fiber and have the fiber not show, you can use a single filament fiber. You can either use glass single filament or PVA. You'll never equal the strength of a 3% load because you can't load it more than 0.25 or 0.20%. So you can't replace a bundled glass fiber with a single strand fiber. That being said, maybe what you're making, you can use a single strand because you don't need that strength. It's, uh, sometimes we hear about breakage, but breakage is rare. Breakage, uh, it could happen, but it very rarely happens. So we're over design, which is good, you know? 
What does the bundle look like? Well, if you looked at it under a microscope, some guy invented a way to take 200 individual strands of glass and connect them by little bridges. That way, when you're mixing it, your mixer doesn't break the glass into little tiny pieces. And that's why they call it bundle. Apparently, it's very, very difficult to do. There's only two companies in the world that have mastered it. Other companies are trying, and we test them, but no one's been able to do it. A little bit harder to mix and uh, to blend in your mix, though, because it's, uh, it's bigger dimension, right? No, it's, it's actually easier because it doesn't filament. When it filaments like that, it's like having thousands and thousands of tiny hairs that prevent your mix from flowing. You'll see today, we use Owens Corning, which is a stiffer fiber, but you could beat the hell out of it when you're mixing. It's not going to fill them. Other fibers, if you're mixing, especially in a high shear mixer, they'll get beat up. And once they fill them, your whole mix turns into a hairball. And we'll see today, we'll use both three-quarter and half-inch. When we direct cast, we'll use half-inch 200 bundle Owens Corning fiber, and it'll flow like nobody's business at a 3% loading. And we use glass fiber or alkali-resistant glass fiber. It's, it's somehow coated with zirconium, and they prove that it has an 18% zirconium coating. Yes, sir? Sorry, uh, back, back to the single filament glass. I've used it in gypsum, and my background is with ornamental plaster, so I know how to do things with that. Uh, and I know that some of the HD glass gets used in face coat for plastic shrinkage, and I've used it uh, to help with slump of gypsum when I'm spraying awkward stuff that helps to helps hold the slump because it's single filament yeah, it breaks up and gives you all those hairs. Um, is that useful in face stuff? They actually make a quarter inch glass fiber that's single filament that you can mix into your face coat that won't show. Now does it help? Yes. It might make up for those times when you have plastic shrinkage in your face coat. But if your mix is right, you probably don't need it. You could use it, yes, it'll help. Then some people do use it, but not a lot. So what we use and what we provide is 200 bundle AR glass fiber that's used in back coats. It's at three, the 3.5, above 3.5 like we talked about, you don't see a continued strength increase, so there's no reason to do it. You could add scrim for extra reinforcement rather than more fiber. And the fiber is dosed as a percentage of the dry weight of the mix. Admixtures are dosed as a percent of the cementitious content, which makes sense because the admixtures actually work on the cementitious content where the fiber <coughs> works on the entire mix. And you guys, this is a user class, meaning you guys can do everything. We'll guide you, but if you've never mixed before, <coughs> take the initiative, weigh the stuff out, learn how it works, you know, and mix. We'll show you how to mix a cubic foot in a mixer. And then pour, you know. Don't worry, we always make mistakes, it's fine. If things don't come out perfect, that's why we do it, right? PVA fiber is uh, the same. It's available in single strand or bundle. <clears throat> now, it costs twice as much as glass, but you need less. The problem is I've never seen a study uh, showing PVA as a direct comparison for glass. So I can't say that PVA works great in a back coat because I've never done the study myself. I've never seen the study done. And I don't know of any large GFRC makers that are substituting PVA fiber. But there's potential there. I just don't know what it is yet. Now, it costs twice as much, but they say you need less. Now, I don't know how much less you need. And I've never seen a comparison. But that's not to say it doesn't work, it's just a little bit different. The next thing we're going to test is we're probably going to test a combination of glass and PVA to try to get a higher flexural yield out of coupon rather than adding more fiber. It does show potential there. Is there any use of the carbon fiber? There again, unless you go through all those tests, most of our big customers are not allowed to use it. So yeah, it might work, it might not, I don't know. Nobody's currently using right. it. Right. Scrim, this piece was a, I think it was a 14 foot inside piece on a wall, and it's a three quarter inches. I would definitely, without question, put scrim in that. 
you know? If you're making a five by 10 island, I would put a layer of scrim in that. If you're making a vanity, probably not. Around a opening for a sink, I would make the opening full thickness, inch and a half, and I would have three layers of scrim within six inches of that opening. For a tile, no. Big wall panels, maybe. Depends on what you're making and what kind of loads they'll see. But as a rule, things will pour today, we don't pour anything big enough to require scrim. But you can use it on certain things. What would be like a parameter for just like where you say, okay, these are... Uh, if I had to make four by eight wall panels or a five by 10 island, I would use it. Little things, no. Here's one of our customers sent us this. this they made it wrong. But we have excellent punch and shear resistance with glass fiber. And cracks don't want to propagate. But this is mature. But like I said, we're over designed. <laughs> but one of the things I'll, I will say is that in our testing, you have almost no flexural strength next day, no matter how high you're compressive. It takes like seven days to get reasonable flexural strength. Really? Yeah. I don't know why. I guess it takes a long time for the fiber to get a bond with the matrix. So it's not fully cured then at that point? Oh my God, no. Even though the compressive strength might be 10,000, the flexural is still maybe a thousand, and what? eventually it'll go up to eighteen hundred. Using your chemicals at what point? Seven days, fourteen days, twenty-one days. 14? It's probably eighty percent, ninety, eighty-five percent at seven days. Okay. The flexural. And sixteen hours is what? Oh, probably fifty percent. Fifty percent. So we're only half the flexural the next day, no matter how high our present. Part of it has to do with the, the chemical reaction within the concrete getting a bond with the glass fiber. Because then I tested 56 day ones and they went from 1800 to 2400. So it continues to gain strength even after 28 days. If we can get our products made and delivered, that's it. They're not going to break. You know? Yes, sir. Right, right. Back to the scrim. Uh, if we're doing big panels, big pieces of scrim, does that affect warpage in any way? Warpage? I wouldn't think so, no. So it should stay stable within the layer. Yeah. The screen have to be encapsulated uh, encapsulated 100%? Well, it depends. It's like rebar. If I was making a beam this deep and it was loaded at the ends, the rebar would be within an inch of the bottom of the beam, right? No, I mean in terms of like water creep on the lines of the... the uh, there's really no... Uh, sometimes the guys who do spray up, the reason that they... It got propagated again that you can't... You need a face coat all the time. The reason for that is when the guys spray up, at a 5% load, sometimes a fiber will be on the face and come all the way through, and the concrete around that fiber is not consolidated, so it'll give the water a path from the front of the panel to the back of the panel and spray up. Where with premix, we don't have that problem because all of our strand, our glass fiber, is incorporated within. So sometimes you can have a path from front to back with spray up where you don't have that in direct cast with what we do. This is cool. This is our, oh, this is what I was talking about. I think this thing's eight foot by six foot, and they're actually tile and wall panels. Our customer, Lebanon, in the Middle East makes these. He casts them on glass. That's actually his reflection in it. And then they uh, do hotels. They put them on the inside of hotels. He said cast them on, on glass? Yeah, that's, this is his reflection wow. in the panel that's stripped. Wow. Which is pretty cool. They make, uh, somehow, no, I didn't ask him, somehow he does this marbling technique and they uh, make huge panels, three quarter of an inch, and then they line uh, hotel lobbies and they use them as tile inside the rooms too. They make huge ones, you know? You need a pretty good release agent for that, I guess. Uh, you just wax the glass and then polish the wax. Okay. What kind of wax is that? We like Johnson's paste wax. Really? That's it? Yeah. Wow. You got to let it dry and then polish it. But glass is actually a great casting surface. We will mimic, mimic because of the fines in our mix, we mimic whatever we cast on. 
And these are direct casts with no face coat and no vibration. How you just dump the glass right? he's using? What's that? How thick is the glass he's using? I don't know. I mean, it's got to be thick, right? Well, think about it. We're, we're always discussing form materials. How do I get a bigger form? Well, glass guys make big glass pieces all the time. You can buy any size glass, right? <coughs> this is a customer out in uh, Monterey Bay. These are boxes he makes. These are just uh, rectangular boxes complete. And he just takes the order, makes his rectangular box, puts the block outs in for all this, makes his countertop, and he goes to the site with his little truck crane, drops it off. Okay, there's your outdoor kitchen. Which I think is pretty cool. He's kind of mastered uh, making all this stuff. There's a customer in Minnesota. This is a 5 by 10 wood look wall piece that they, uh, I don't know what they're doing with this piece. He, just as an experiment, he cast this and then the granite guy, that's a granite truck, put it on his truck and drove it around for a month just to see what would happen to it. The only thing that happened is that he got a tiny little dent where it sat on the piece. So if you make your pieces right, cure them right, they're extremely durable. No, no warpage or anything on that big piece. I mean, he's a good caster. Not to uh, badmouth anyone else, but he knows how to make his mixes. He knows how to cure them. He, you know what I mean? He understands how not to have warpage. How thick would you say that piece is? Uh, probably three quarter. Mixes are easy. Here's about a cubic foot. 60 sand, 60 cement, replace 10% of your cement with silica fume, or add mix 3 to 3.5%, three depending on what you're making. If you want ultra fine details with ours, add a little bit more add mix and it'll actually pick up detail. I don't know about better, but more. Like yesterday, we did all those mixes. Today we'll use 3%, 3.5%, somewhere in there. It's not written in stone. We did most of our testing initially at 3.5%. Did our last testing at three, they came out fine. People generally start to report problems at two and a half percent. Problems including map cracking, warpage, shrinkage. Mike actually did tests down to what? And then you hit a point where it was a difference, right? Yeah, he just said, okay, it's warping now. It's not warping, you know? What percentage? For the why? For the admix. But yeah, if we, if we get down below, how much do you need? I would start at three if you have problems. Some people who use different sands need three and a half. There's a handful of people that use four, not many. Above that, it starts to look like plastic or corian, you know. It really does. It resembles plastic. The face coat is a little higher. Like we talked about, with the same basic ingredients, and just by changing some of your sand sizes, it's hard to get below 10,000 with our stuff if you do everything right. You're usually about 10, 12. You can get to 16 with one size of sand. Particle packing means different size particles fit between other particles, and then it gets harder and harder and harder, right? the compressive goes up. So if you play with your sands, we actually have two different size sands over there, and you blend them with the same amount of uh, cement and silica fume, you can get to 20,000. It's really cool, really. What is the, for getting high performance concrete? Uh, you just need different size sands. No, but what is the like ratio when you, if you want to go to that, if it's been specified? Uh, it depends on what the guy wants. Whatever they want, you can do. This is not written in stone, but you use 55%, 25 It's basically as you get smaller, you use half the size right down the line to get it. So you need to mix them all together. So right. You need to have a few different sizes of sand. Right. Sometimes, like, uh, we have two sizes there that come with different sizes within them, and we can use that to make it. In fact, we're going to have an ECC mix, a pre-bagged one, that will add the sizes for you. It'll hit, I think we hit like 22,000 with it. 22,000 PVA fiber, it'll work for certain things for certain people. And it's just particle packing, really.
we're going to demonstrate this today. <clears throat> we're going to do progressively easier casting today. First, we're going to spray a face coat, hand lay a back coat. And then we're going to eliminate the face coat. We're going to, I mean, eliminate the brushing of the face coat and eliminate the hand packing. We're going to spray a face coat, not brush it, spray a back coat. It'll just get easier and easier. At the end of the day, we won't actually do anything yet. We'll be pouring something. We'll show you how easy it can be. This is actually a guy here pouring a tile. He's using CSA because I don't know how many times he poured it a day. Maybe three or four, three, three times. So they have, if you have limited molds, the only time I would use CSA or calcium sulfate illuminate is if you want to cast multiple times in one day. Otherwise, Portland will do everything you need to overnight. But here he had limited tile molds, so he was casting them three times a day just to get more out of his molds, which you can do. How, how is it jeopardized uh, quality? Uh, I would say no if you do everything right. Is it more expensive? Yeah, a little bit, fractionally. Here's why direct casting works. I forget who asked me this. Uh, somebody asked me, what's the heaviest part of your mix? He said sand, right? Well, specific gravity is a material's uh, weight compared to its volume compared with water. If you have a cubic foot of water, it weighs 62.4 pounds. It's easy to envision, cubic foot of solid water. Its specific gravity is one. Other ingredients are a little harder. It, cement, it's not the fluffed up stuff that you buy. You have to envision a solid block of cement with no air in it. It's 3.15 times heavier than the same volume of water. What that means is when we pour a mix and ruin it, meaning it totally separates, the cement wants to be at the bottom, sand is next, 2.62, glass fiber, and pozzolan, because the pozzolan is made of silicon dioxide, so is the glass, up here, and everyone knows what bleed water is, right? So we take advantage of that when we direct cast. We mix our mix. It's not enough to have bleed water, but it's enough that when we pour the glass fiber, the glass fiber doesn't want to end up on the bottom, right? Because it wants to float up. Now, if we kept adding water, you'd see the glass fiber at the very top. It would float out. But it's just enough that when we pour, the glass fiber doesn't end up all at the bottom. That's the problem with steel fiber. When you pour steel fiber, the steel fiber ends up on the face if it's too liquid, because it'll travel right through. Where our glass fiber is lighter, and it's actually stronger than, than steel fibers. It's so stronger today, than steel fiber? Uh-huh. Really? Yeah, there's a, I gotta organize all our data a little better, but I have a data sheet that shows you the different uh, values of material. Okay. Well, think about a piece of glass. How far can you stretch it before it breaks, right? Yeah. And how far can you stretch steel? And it's, uh, you know, but this is why direct casting works. And there's a lot of people that only do that. Now, it's limited, like we talked about, if you want to expose stuff. But uh, today we're going to pour a whole bunch of stuff direct cast. You'll see if we get the mix right, which we should, you won't see any fiber unless you acid etch it. And that's why, because of the different specific gravities. Vinny will show you how to use our mix design spreadsheets. We fill in the green parts only, and then it spits out what you need for a mix. We have it available for free. Either email us or you can download it on our Dropbox, and we'll send you a copy of it and teach you how to use it. This is your best friend for making samples. Buy a KitchenAid mixer. Buy a super sensitive scale. You can crank out. I don't know. One day I had to make color samples for all our color. I probably did 30 one day, 30 the next day. So that's 60 samples I made in two days. So you can do your whole line of colors easily. Another option, if you use similar ingredients to what we use, I put all of our colors on our Dropbox page. So a lot of our customers will send their customers our Dropbox page. It'll get them into color family, and then they can make samples from there, which is easy. We show you different loadings. I think it's on the next page. Color is easy. You dose it based on the cementitious content of your mix. So if someone's talking about a 5% color load, 
we're talking about 5% of the cementitious content. The cementitious content is cement and poslin added together. 7% would be a big loading of color. There's some like titanium dioxide, you can go all the way to 15. There's some like a carbon black, you don't want to go above five or six. Every color has a saturation point. The saturation point is where adding more color doesn't make too much of a visible difference in the color. So once you hit that saturation point, that's it. And different colors have different saturation points. Here's a good example of that. From memory, I think these are uh, 0 0.5, 2 maybe, 5 and 7. You can see the way it goes right up the line. That's the way all these are. But I made all these when we got our new colors in so that, and they're online so you can see exactly what the colors do. I think it's 0 0.5, 2 0.5, 5 and 7. You can see this one here, there's not a nickel's worth of difference between 5 and 7. So these colors are uh, iron, iron oxide based? Most are iron oxide, some are uh, chromium. The bright colors, right? Yeah, we have, the cool thing about our colors is we have all colors. We have two different blues, got two different greens, so we can... Do you color service if I to something? Uh, close. You can go on our Dropbox and get close from there. If I send you a piece, can you, or can you do service like that? Or well, what we do is we work off our color chart. So if you tell us a color there, we can come close. We don't guarantee an exact match, but we can come really close. Are they all UV stable? Uh, they're UV stable. Uh, all iron oxides are. Some of the uh, blacks, if you do it with a carbon black, it's not as UV stable as an iron oxide black. Right. That's it, they're just black. Right. Yeah, the others are as UV stable as pigments can be. Okay. Do you ever put that like diamond clear coating on any of these things? Well, we have our stamp shield that when I made all these color samples, some I left unground, some I acid etched, and then I put sealer on them so you could see the effect of our stamp shield over the sealer. You Does that have sealer on there in that picture? No, these are the raw, Those these are, are the back sides you're looking at. Those are just all the color samples we made. Those just to get an idea. Those are bucket uh, bottles, is that it? No, you go to the uh, grocery store and you find plastic plates that have no design whatsoever on the bottom. They can be hard to find. I actually found mine at Giant. I bought a whole bunch of them. But then one, uh, one mixer load is six pounds, and six pounds will do uh, one, two, six of these. And then you just write the date and write what you did on the back so you don't lose it. And that way, if you get organized, get a whole bunch of different colors, you can sit there and crank them out one day, have them the next, then set up a wall of color for people. And it's easy to do. Blending colors, if you've got any color eye at all, if you start with, you know, known color, you can look at your colors and then just make five batches and you can match your own colors pretty easily. Because the way that it looks wet is almost the way it's going to look when it's sealed. So you just dip out some color and smear it on a white thing and, okay, we're close, you know. Is most of the stuff when it's finished sealed then? Yeah. Right. Especially, uh, it depends on what you're doing. Most building facades, they don't want to seal. But everything else, I would say, gets sealed. Because any time you have a 30-story 30, 30 building, you don't want anything that could require any maintenance. Right. Right. See what you can actually do every year or something. No, I would say it's stamp shield. Oh, I would say every four, five years, six years outdoors. And it's easy. You just lightly sand it, put another coat on, and you're done. I just helped the reseal on, a, on one, and after almost three years, it was still beating water. The only problem is it looked like somebody had been butchering cattle on one end of the countertop. There was just scratch marks all over. It was so hard that he eventually took the countertop back to his shop because we tried to dry grind it in the field, we couldn't touch it. He had to bring it back to his shop and it was a light aggregate exposure, but it was so hard that he had to wet grind it with uh, hard diamonds and then go to 50, 100, 200 just to get the scratch marks out. Yeah, the stuff that we're installing is probably next day you might hit 50% of the strength. 
that you're going to hit. And once it sits around, boy, it keeps going. I should actually test. I did. When we made our original test, it still was gaining strength six months later. The problems, everyone has problems. This job was a job I was called in on the Hamptons to consult on. This was actually supposed to be an infinity edge for a pool, if you can imagine. But it had about $100,000 worth of bad GFRC that had to be ripped out and replaced. This one had all the problems. It had map cracking, plastic shrinkage, warpage, pinholes. This was actually a sealer. <laughs> yeah, this one has all problems wrapped into one. And the sealer was actually delaminated. So that was a really bad one. We'll cover each one. We could get map cracking today if we put a piece on that pallet out there, sprayed it, and waited 10 minutes of the sun hitting it. The face coat is guaranteed to map crack. It's only the surface. The surface gets a plastic shrinkage in it, and then it cracks because it shrinks, so you have the map cracking. Sometimes it's severe enough to see with your naked eye. Sometimes you've got to wet it out to see. And if you have to wet it, a lot of times the sealer will actually hide it. It comes from, dries out too quickly, like we talked about. You have to cure rather than dry your face coat. The pros, meaning the guys with equipment and mixers and stuff, they're fanatical about spraying their face coat, and as soon as they can, they're on it with a back coat so they don't leave it exposed to the air. We have to wait a little longer because a lot of times we're hand packing. So if we spray it too thin, it dries out, we hand pack it, it's already cracked. There's nothing you can do. It might take a day or two to see. Improper curing, if we uh, stripped it the next day, didn't heat it, we strip it at 3,000 PSI, at 3,000 PSI, not enough water is hydrated with the cement, combined with the cement, so the water is free to leave. When water leaves the slab, this applies to curling as well, it leaves a little channel behind. That channel closes up and things shrink. And that's warpage, map cracking, a lot of those problems. The other problem is not enough admix. We had a customer last winter that was using the same mix that we use and 40 other people use, or more than that. And he had problems with map cracking. So I went down, I was like, are you putting enough face coat on? Are you mixing it right? This and that. Turns out that his scale was wrong, and he was only putting half the amount of admix he was supposed to in. So once he did that, his problems went away again. So not enough admix will cause it. The high absorption sand, one of the ways you lose moisture is to the atmosphere. You can lose moisture internally because you mix it up, it seems okay, you spray it and then your sand takes water out of your mix and absorbs it into the capillaries. All sands have an absorption factor, and the absorption factor will be satisfied. It's going to take the stuff out of your mix to satisfy it. There's another interesting call I had the other day. A customer was putting dry sand in his form and then spraying a face coat on it, building it up so when he stripped, it showed sand, and he had warpage problems. Well, what was happening is, the dry sand was sucking the mixed water out from below, and its piece was cupping in the mold. So there, if you have it, there are solutions to it. Number one, I would look at your sand, if you're using everything else being equal, and then look at your production methods. What did you recommend for that application? His was simple. You just pre-wet that bed of sand gotcha. before spring of his coat. Then it wouldn't suck the water out. At least I think it would. I don't have a good picture of it because we very seldom see it, but plastic shrinkage are long cracks. Sometimes people will get it along an edge. Sometimes people will get it where their mold is constrained and it goes around a corner. But plastic shrinkage, the entire piece went through the same thing that map cracking did. We had another customer that had sand in a plant like this for a whole year. It was concrete sand. He said, oh, I'm just going to use this in a back coat. Well, it took two days, and two days he would have longitudinal cracks on his pieces because the sand was sucking water out of his mix. You could get it if we strip tomorrow and we put the pieces out in the sun. It may get plastic shrinkage because it's losing moisture. Of all these problems that you're indicating here, would most of these be picked up in production or are some of these longer term issues? That you would I would say if you get through two weeks, you're fine. Two weeks? Yeah. It's very seldom that something goes out and gets installed and then, um, because we're pushing our stuff. We're pushing it with 
plastic heat overnight blankets. So we're pushing it past that point. The uh, drying shrinkage one, the, the one that the guy had this plastic shrinkage cracks, it took two to three days for it to develop. And that's an indication something internally is going on. If it takes that long. Warpage, everyone has problems with. The main cause is one side of your piece gains or loses moisture faster than the other. When I talk to people, I have warpage. Well, the first thing, do you have warpage in the mold? And then what direction do you have warpage in the mold? If the ends of the piece come up in the mold, that means that top surface was losing moisture faster than the bottom. And what can happen is it leaves a gap, air gets underneath, and it causes your piece, because it absorbs carbon dioxide, to turn white around the edges. So that's the backside. The next problem, that guy who had sand in his mold, his center was bowing up because this side got shorter because it was losing moisture. So when you strip and you lay your piece flat, the top is obviously wants to lose moisture. Well, typically it gets shorter than it bows up this way. Sometimes you can fix it. If you strip a piece at 3,000 PSI, it's almost guaranteed to work, especially long, thin ones. But sometimes you can actually fix it by wetting the backside, allowing it to absorb moisture, it'll actually go back down. And then once it hits a point where it's six or 7,000, it doesn't want to warp anymore. Is that the plastic? What's the plastic's for? Just to prevent that, that hydration process, evaporation process? Sure. We don't, the big manufacturers put metal frames on the back of their pieces. Those metal frames are sufficient to eliminate warpage in most cases. Mm -hmm. What we have to do is we have to develop mixes and techniques that you can pour. Oh, we've had some people stretch it out to 30 foot with no metal back on and not warp it. It's really hard to do that. You have to be really particular. And even a 5 by 10 island, it's hard to make it without warping it. If something goes wrong, it's not hot enough, your shop's too cold, it doesn't cure right, and on and on, it'll warp. And yet we have customers that almost never have warpage. It's foreign to them. So there's, we believe there's always a reason for something. It's just a matter of finding out the reason, right? But warpage, once you're above 10,000, you should be able to put live steam on the bottom, full sun on the top, and it won't bend because it won't absorb moisture from the bottom and it won't lose moisture from the top. Would you recommend to have a steam room? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't really need one. If I was in production and I had 300 pieces, I would have a room with 95 or 98 percent relative humidity, and that'd be perfect. Steam, it ruins all our wood forms, you know, it tears stuff apart. So you could just put a humidifier in a room? Uh, you could, but you, if you get 100 percent, it tends to ruin steel forms. So most guys, they have humidity systems that they take the temperature up to 120, and then they have a 95 percent relative humidity. But what we do is we cover with plastic. If you insulate, you'll get up to 130 on a day like today. No problem. You don't want to go like 140. It's too hot. And even though you don't test the compressive, you know by time and heat what it is. If you're up in the 110, 120 range for three hours, four hours, you're gaining 1,000 PSI per hour. And what time frame from four? You can strip in 12 hours a day like today. So the temperature runoff will be occur what an hour later, two hours, three hours. I would say today, an hour later. An hour later. Yeah, because our mixes that we're going to dump today will be 80 degrees. Okay. Yesterday, they didn't get super hot. We didn't put any insulation. We only put plastic because I didn't want them getting to 140. So do you pay more attention to the ambient than you do the mix? Uh, I would say both. You want the mix cool enough that it's not going to run away, but then the ambient might force you to use some accelerator. So you'll was. actually temperature, put a temperature gauge on your mix? Yeah, 50 degrees, 50 degrees is a perfect shop temp. That's what I worked in for years. You, uh, and then you use accelerator in your mix. If it's below 60, you can use a percent, two percent of our accelerator. Cover with plastic, and you might need a heating blanket rather than just insulation. So you let the chemical do the work instead of the temperature. Right, because it costs a lot to heat a plant. Yeah.
Can you judge between 3,000 and 6,000 PSI just by... Oh, yeah. Three is, to us, three is really weak. I mean, but it was scratchy. Yeah, it was scratchy. Yeah. Yeah, if, it's, if you get above 120 at night, 130, you know you gained 1,000 PSI each hour was above there. So you know it's ready without testing it. Some people do a scratch test, people that really know, they take a nail and they scratch the back and they can tell just from years of doing it how, how tight it is really. But you just have to take all those factors into account. We already covered high absorption sands. Test your sand first. We, the clues are plastic, or plastic shrinkage cracks and then false setting. Most false setting comes from sand, period. And if you're using the right cement. Cements can cause it, but it's generally the sand. Here's all the stuff we're going to use today. These are not hobbyist shops. There's plenty of people using this equipment. But this adds up to, I added it up to about 2,500 bucks. 800 there, 400, 300, you know. And the rest of the stuff's basic. Buy very good scales. They're very important. The ones we have today, I don't know, maybe $600 scales. This is actually a Harbor Freight scale. It's my favorite one. It's a $20 scale, but it's my favorite one for weighing admix and whatnot. Then the other basics. This, as you'll see, you can almost get rid of. We'll show you tomorrow how to uh, use acid and sandpaper to get it. People who grind don't make a very good living, most of them. Because, <laughs> well, people are not paying, will not pay more for a ground piece versus hit it with acid, sandpaper, it looks modern, it looks smooth. If you've got to spend four hours, five hours going through this grinding process, the people don't care how you made it, you know? I mean, there's times that I used to love to grind rocks and stuff, but get paid for it if you do it and understand what you're getting into. Tomorrow, we're going to strip, use sandpaper and acid, and then seal pieces. Some will color, too. Too far. Here's the next step. This is about $30,000. This mixer will mix uh, 700 pounds in three minutes. And this is a peristaltic pump which will pump premix, meaning it'll pump and spray face coat with no fiber, back coat with fiber. I would say this is about 10 grand, this is about 20. And even girls can do it. <laughs> The rest of the world's way ahead of us. This is stuff made in China. This is a man down there with a piece. What happened in the U.S. is we really got hung on wet cast, thick pieces. For some reason or another, we're making six inch thick wall panels and we're putting them on the sides of buildings and the building has to hold that weight up. Well, we should be making three quarter inch pieces, right? But we just got, we went down this road where we make heavy things. Now I'm looking at I don't know, probably five different customers of ours that are beginning to make outside wall panels, thin section ones, you know, because they work. Part of the reason that U.S. got away from it is because of the problems with GFRC. They had entire buildings fail. But it's getting back to where there's more quality, less people doing it, and the engineers and architects are actually recognizing that. The problem is a building has to be specified from day one to be GFRC, rather than wet cast because it's a whole different uh, mindset and connections and steel and all that that goes into it. But I think we'll see more of it. Here's where we're kicking other people's asses in the decorative part. This is actually a concrete door one of our customers made. He's a little bit out there, but he, uh, it's an outdoor door for his, uh, his garden. Like he said, it'll never, never rot, never move, never this, never that. This is a bathtub that one of our guys made. We are way ahead of the rest of the world in doing stuff like that, and it's becoming more and more acceptable to do. This is actually one of the last ones I ever did, but it started out where concrete was a fad, concrete countertops. Oh, this is cool, I have them. But now we've reached the point where we can make pieces that don't break, we can seal pieces that don't stain and aren't a thick topical sealer, 
and we can deliver something, get paid for it, and have everyone be happy, meaning the owner be happy, us be happy. You don't get that phone call, you know, a month later, you know, this happened or that happened. There's still a ways to go, but when I did it, there was no sealers that I could rely on and could get to sleep at night. Now we have choices, you know, outdoor choices, stamp shield, indoor choices, H12. Each one is probably a 90 to 95 percent success rate, and the ones that do fail, we can talk through and fix, which is important. That's why I think it's a bright future ahead. Everyone starts, uh, not everyone, but most people start in the garage making countertops, but then we like to help people bring the high performance and ultra high performance. And we have data that'll help you back it. For instance, we have people that use the exact mix we're using today that can use our data for submittals or else we'll help you put data together because we have the testing equipment to do it. So now you can go to an architect and say, here's my data, and this guy you know, started out in the garage, now he's making walls, you know, his own wall system. And he can prove through empirical data that it works, which is important. This is actually our Australian trainer and distributor. I use this as an example. He got paid more for the concrete work inside of the house than the guy who poured the basement, garage, sidewalk. He billed more than him. And that's, I'm seeing that more and more. It's not unusual to see $30,000, $40,000 worth of concrete inside of a house. They're not all houses, but architects understand it and want to work with it. That's it for our lecture portion. Any questions? Anybody use like uh, vacuum foam molds? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The problem with vacuum foam molds for tile is you need to make them thick enough, and when you make them thick enough, the curve at the bottom, which ends up to be the top of the tile, ends up rounded over. So one solution that I came up with for a customer was we vacuum forms in a thinner diameter, and then we actually glue a thicker piece of plastic to the bottom of the mold. So it gives it rigidity, and he still gets the 90 at the bottom. So that's an excellent way to do it. What's the gain in going that way? It's cheap. You can get vacuum form molds made much less than uh, rubber. Now, rubber molds you can use, uh, I don't know, I would say a 1,000 times. Polytech doesn't like me saying that, but I'm not sure what their line is on how many, how many times. How many times do you get out of one, right? About 150. 150? I mean, we still have 40 years. Still looks the same, so. Yeah. We haven't reached the maximum. Yeah, I don't know what the maximum is. If you take care of them a long time. So it depends on your investment. If you need to make molds in a hurry, the plastic guys will actually cut you a aluminum master. And the other thing is they have a little hole in the middle that sucks the air out. But they do work, yeah. Hey, someone asked, you mentioned not sealing outdoor building panels. How does this work with extreme freeze thaw cycles? Someone asked on Facebook, how do you deal with freeze thaw cycles on outdoor building panels if they're not sealed? Well, GFRC gets its freeze thaw durability from the lack of penetration of water. Water can't get in, expand, and freeze, so you don't need air entrainment. That said, our air, testing it, runs about 3 to 4 percent, but our absorption is generally less than 3 percent. So if you have a high PSI, a low absorption, it gets the freeze thaw durability of that. We went through 325 cycles. 300 was normal with zero degradation, but we went through 325 cycles with no freeze thaw problems. And right now we're testing, this is a city mix in the background, a lightweight aggregate. We're doing dual tests of control with our ad mix and regular sand and city mix to do the freeze thaw durability. But everyone who uses uh, different sands, different cement, should also do a freeze thaw test. They're a little expensive, but if you're going to do outdoor building pieces, you should be doing that. Is anybody making shower panels? Shower panels are great. Today we're going to pour some examples, or today or tomorrow of four by eights, and Eric actually does, he does a fabulous job of wood look showers. 
It makes them look like wood, seals them, and it looks like you got wood in your shower. My thought to shower panels was you could make four by eight or whatever size blanks and then go in the field and not template and just measure and then cut the shower panel and drill the holes in the field. So you could actually make shower panels that worked anywhere. Is it the sealer that you rely on or is the density of the concrete so much that the, there's no water absorption? Well, they wouldn't uh, warp in the shower, but they would stain soap scum. Most people use our stamp shield in the shower. It's easy to apply, works great, repels water. That way they can uh, clean the shower. Is this Same thing as a shower pan, for instance? Like shower pans, you use a grit in it. You can put grit in the sealer, or else you can texture the shower pan so that you don't need grit, and people don't fall. Step and steps. What's that? What, what do you do in terms of anti-slip for steps? Put grit. Grit in the sealer. So you put you put some sand in the sealer. Yeah. For the shower pan. You talked about that infinity pool and how it had everything. Can you talk specifically about that example? How they happen to have everything go wrong? Uh, that's hard to say. I guess they, in truth, they were a beginning fabricator and they did a job that was way over their head, for starters. So they attempted to take on, you know, hundred thousand dollars worth of work out of the garage, and it just one problem snowballed into the other. There's a lot that can get you. For instance, on that Infinity Edge, they use mortar as an attachment for their panels. GFRC is so thin section that it heats and cools quickly, so that panel wants to move constantly. And if you put, if you use mortar to attach it, number one, it sucked it in, it caused it to bow. The next thing that happened is it constrained it while it was trying to move. So they actually crack their panels. You have to use a PL, a um, polyurethane, or, or something flexible to attach panels. You can't attach them with mortar, especially big panels, or else they move. When they do building panels, they have a flex anchor in the back that attaches to the steel stud of the building. And that flex anchor allows the panel to expand and contract. What about the epoxy to attach? Inside, it would be fine. But outdoors, there again, it's not flexible enough. It won't let it move. And they make uh, they make glues now, polyurethane adhesives that will allow you to have a flexible attachment design. Do you have data on the flexible movement of GFRC or your mix design? Uh, we don't have expansion contraction data. It would be the same. Steel and concrete are about the same. Oh really? So it moves quite a bit. Back. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. What happens on? thicker section pieces like a parking garage, the piece, the panel might be this thick. So it takes forever for the sun to hit that and to cause it to change. By that change time, the whole rest of it's changed. Whereas our stuff on the outside of a building, the sun hits it. Yeah, especially, imagine a black building in the sun. It's going to go from 50 over to 100 every day. So Some of those panels are 30 and 40 foot long, so they're, they're expansion joints. Joint there needs to be fairly large. Yeah, they use that and then they caulk. Yeah. So and then they place their anchors. Engineers have to do this. Right. They design the anchorage system to allow for the A little movement. Right. But they do move all over the place. Mm. Even you're out. That's why. That's why the city mix for rather than foam coring outside, don't foam core and encapsulate foam outside. Right. Because the uh, I guess it acts as an air chamber. And it expands and contracts till it eventually almost always cracks the top. Oh, really? Yeah. But so this. That's what this was, will replace that then? Well, this you can use as a back coat, as a lightweight back coat. You can replace half your sand, you save a quarter of the weight just to make everything lighter. And you can go up to 100% replacement. But then you can also make a mix with a 30% cement content. So it's almost like a castable foam that cures. So if I had to make a piece that needed to look, you know, this thick, I would put a little back coat on, I'd put the lean city mix mix in all the way up and put another back coat. And the city mix mix, you can actually put fiber in, it becomes a structural foam layer. Are we going to do this uh, over the chain? Yeah, we use this. We got a lot planned. We got plenty to pour. So this would be used a lot for garden ornamentation type stuff? Yeah, or uh, any time you wanted to make a vanity and save a quarter of the weight or... How about lightweight aggregate? Yeah. That way? Yeah. Anytime you want. We're already light, but imagine if you get lighter, right? Sure. 
you're making a fireplace surround and the fireplace throws a lot of heat, will that flash off? Will that melt out? You would have to get it to like 800, 900 degrees, which is doubtful. We have a, no, I'd say there, there would never be a problem. There's a customer in California who uses that exclusively in fireplace surrounds. And he does like 20 or 30 a day. So another customer that uses it exclusively in a fire, gas fire pits. So it's used, you know. Inside? What's the that? Fire, the fire box? No, not in the fire box, but the fireplace surround. Concrete is good for probably a thousand degrees. The only time I've seen problems is outdoor gas fireplaces. They put a million BTU burner in, the wind blows, and it gets slight cracks on the edges of it. Because it gets probably getting 1500 degrees. And you cannot use this to make wood fireplaces. You can't use, you should not use any concrete besides refractor, refractory cements that are pre-made for that to do that. This stuff is, you could probably get to 1500 with our regular GFRC, but I would not trust it to make a fire pit, no. Well, especially with the water, especially with rain on it. Exactly. It would spall and blow up and go in someone's eye and you get sued. Oh, okay. <laughs> so go ahead and use it. Yeah, don't use it for that. Yeah, there's no con. You can buy refractory cements that come pre-bagged with aggregate and everything. And you could make your fire bowl and then you just line it with this thick of refractory. Or whatever you want to do, you know. We have another customer that makes fire rings and he actually lays refractory brick inside and mortars them. 